church. Welcome to this part of our worship service. I trust that you had a good week and God has blessed you and that he will bless you again as we worship together in this divine service. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, we find what has come to be known as the Gospel Commission, or the Great Commission. Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. <clears throat> and then we have this assurance in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, where he says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. I've pondered this, these texts uh, a lot over time, and most recently. That commission was given more than 2,000 years ago. At that time, the world population was estimated to have been 300 million. 300 million people, 2,000 years ago. And this gospel commission was given to a handful of people. Probably we can reliably estimate about 120 dedicated, committed disciples of Christ. carry the gospel to 300 million people, lacking the technology that we have today, lacking the transportation methods that we have today. You know that the population of the world remained virtually unchanged for the next 1,000 years. It took until 1804 for the world population to reach 1 billion. And it took another 160 years almost for the population to reach 3 billion. But then things began to change. It took just 20 years for another billion to be added to the population. By 1980, the world population was 4 billion. By 1990, it was 5 billion. By 2000, the population of planet Earth was 6 billion. That means from, in 40 years, from 1960 to 2000, the population doubled in just 40 years. By 2012, the population of planet Earth was 7 billion. Today, it's 8 billion. 8 billion people. What does a billion look like? Can you visualize a billion? Well, here's a little image for you. If you were to take a million hundred dollar bill, US dollars, a hundred of them would fill a briefcase. I mean a, a million, sorry, a million bills would fill a briefcase. That's manageable. A billion would fit on ten standard pallets. Ten standard pallets. That's the difference between a million and a billion. One trillion, and we haven't got to a trillion on our population yet, but just to give you an idea, one trillion 
hundred dollar bill would cover a football field to the depth of seven feet. That's more than my a trillion uh, hundred dollar bill. So get some kind of idea of the numbers that we're talking about. And so when I think about that, say eight billion people on planet Earth, and I think how are we supposed to reach this rapidly increasing population? How are we to fulfill the gospel commission? Even with all the technology that we have today. Now here's the thing. It is estimated that there are more than three billion people on the earth today who have never heard the name of Jesus and have had little chance or have little chance of ever hearing the gospel. Three billion people. That is the entire population of the world back in 1960 when I was born. That number of people have never heard never heard the gospel, and probably never will. Furthermore, it is estimated that 67% of all humans from AD 27, when the gospel commission was given, until the present, have never heard of the gospel. 67% of all people who have ever lived Those are frightening statistics. Those are worrying figures. But it's not all bad news. We look at it in some kind of context. Uh, hopefully, it will be a little bit more encouraging. Let's look at this from an Adventist perspective. The Adventist Church was formally established on May 21, 1863. The world population at that time was 1.3 billion people in 1863. At that time, the ratio of Adventists to non-Adventists, to the world population, should I say, was one Adventist for every 373,000 people. One Adventist, 373,000 and some change. So every Adventist would have to reach 373,000 people for the gospel to reach the entire world. Doable? You reckon? I see Stephen nodding there. I'm not sure. I'm a bit cynical. 373,000 people. A lot of people. By 1900, the world population had increased to uh, one point. Uh, six, eight billion people. The ratio of Adventists to the rest of the population had decreased to one Adventist for every 21,000 people, more or less. Okay? Bit of change there as well. Okay? That's getting more doable. Yeah? By 1960, as I said, the world population had reached three billion. The ratio of Adventists to the world population was 1 to 2,500. The Adventist population was increasing fairly rapidly. By 2000, the population had doubled to 6 billion. The ratio of Adventists to the world population was 1 for every 519 people. Doable? Get in there. By 2021, the world population was just under 8 billion. The ratio was 1 to 368. So each one of you sitting there today is responsible for 358 people. You like that? That's good. Okay. In 2021, there were 21.9 million Seventh-day Adventists in the world. 
We have over 9,000 schools, 118 tertiary institutions, 229 hospitals and sanitariums, 1,475 clinics and dispensaries, 128 dental clinics, 18 media centers, 57 publishing houses, and ADRA is present in 130 countries around the world. And the SDA Church itself is present in 212 of the 235 countries recognized by the United Nations. But there are still 3 billion people who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ, who have never heard the gospel and may never hear that news. When I start to think of that, I, I, I sometimes wonder how on earth will we ever fulfill the gospel commission? How will Jesus' words come to fruition when he said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come? Let's bring it a bit closer to home. On the Isle of Man, there is approximately one Adventist for every 1,500 residents. That's a big place. One Adventist, one of us, for every 1,500 people on the island. How shall this work be finished? I pondered this question many times. I walk down the street and I see all those people walking, carrying on their lives, going about their business, and I think, how shall we reach them? You go to cities like London, New York, and you see the crowds and crowds of people, and you wonder how many of them have ever heard of the gospel. But to answer this question, I think we need to look at how the work began more than 2,000 years ago relates to my children's stories. Matthew chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Matthew 4, and we're going to read verses 18 to 22. It says, Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, uh, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So they were four. From such a small beginning. Did Jesus really think that these he called simple fishermen could become fishers of men? Jesus performed two miracles that I believe he intended to teach us and to encourage us and to show us how the work would be done, how the work would be finished. Two miracles which form the bookends to Jesus' ministry here on earth. And they serve as prophetic metaphors for the beginning and the end of the work of the gospel here on earth. If the disciples stopped to, spot, to ponder how they were to reach the world, as we might well be doing this morning, Jesus performed these two miracles to address their questions, to address their doubts. The first miracle was performed right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and the second at, his, at the end of his ministry here on earth. The first we find in Luke chapter 5, and it's verses 1 uh, to 2. I'm not sure where you're going to look. It's the last page. Sorry, Luke chapter 5. 
question is why you didn't choose the other one. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, uh, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught any catch. But because you say so, I will let down the net. Can you just hear the, the doubt in his voice? You know, I'm a professional fisherman. What are you? What do you know? But because you say so, I will let down the net. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled the boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore left everything and followed them. I followed him. I love that image, don't you? The biggest catch of their lives and they just abandon it and leave it to follow Jesus. They were experienced fishermen, professionals. They had fished all night and caught nothing. They knew their trade. Then Jesus tells them to let down their nets in the daytime. What does Jesus, a carpenter, an itinerant preacher, know about fishing? The nets began to break, and the fish boat began to sink. The huge catch was nothing but a miracle. It was not down to their skill or their knowledge of the sea. It was not down to their equipment or their technology. It was purely a miracle. And having caught the biggest catch of their lives, they left everything and followed Jesus. Then near the end of his ministry, Jesus performed a similar miracle. We find the story in John chapter. And afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Verse 3, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. Remember that three years before this, they had left their nets, left their boats to follow Jesus. They say, we're going back to the boat. We're going back to the fish. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. They caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, Throw a net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Two stories. One, they couldn't, both, in both stories, they could not catch any fish. In both stories, they caught so much fish, they couldn't handle it. 
They couldn't deal with it. What made the difference? Jesus performed the miracle. And they catch so many fish, they could not lift it, uh, lift the net back onto the boat. It was around this time that Jesus, just before Jesus ascended to heaven, that he gave his disciples the gospel commission. Against this background, Jesus comes to them and he said, All authority, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Jesus told them that all power had been given to him, therefore they were to go. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 we read, Then he answered me, he answered and spoke to me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Not by human might or human power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's domain. The Holy Spirit is God's domain. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, talking about Jesus, he gave them this command Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my, that my Father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with, with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, what happens when you drop a grenade in the water? Boom. Boom. And here we see the grenade falling into the water in Acts chapter one, Acts chapter two, verses one to four. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tons of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. We jump to verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. How many were in the upper room? How many were there waiting? About 120. And in one day, 3,000 people. In Acts chapter 4, it says, But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to be about 5,000. 3,000. 5,000. What happens when you drop grenades in the water? You catch a lot of fish. The miracle of the fishes occurred at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and again at the end of his ministry. This illustrates how the work begins and how it ends. It begins with the Holy Spirit and it will end with the Holy Spirit. Not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. Our technology, our professional skills, they may be used by God. But the success of the work is not down to these things, but by the power and the influence. How will Seventh-day Adventists finish the work on earth? How will we reach the three billion people who have never heard the name of Jesus? How will we bring this island to a knowledge of God and his gospel? The work will, will end the way it began. Not by might, nor by power. 
I was a useless fisherman, which is all. But I was 